Well, welcome Auburn and Newington Anglican Church growth team leaders. Uh, I have with me Andrew Sheed, who's the head of Old Testament at Moore College. Hi. Uh, and, uh, and also was one of my lecturers, and especially in third year when we looked at the Psalms together. Uh, and so I thought it'd be good to have a chat with Andrew just about the Psalms in general, and maybe some tips and tricks in terms of trying to write a Bible study uh, about one of the Psalms or multiple Psalms. Uh, but I thought we would start with just uh, what is interesting to you about the Psalms? Where do your passion for the Psalms come from? Yeah. Um, what is interesting to me about the Psalms? I guess uh, they're very relatable. Uh, there's a psalm that hits every life situation. Uh, I think Christians, even though they weren't written for Christians, um, they were written for uh, Israelites who lived long before Jesus. Uh, they're still a part of the Old Testament that we feel are able to relate to very directly. Um, and they're poetry, uh, so they're very rich. Um, if you think about the Bible as a book that tells us what God is like, if you read a, a story in the Bible, say the story of Joseph or David, they're great stories, but there's not a lot in them that says, and so this is what God is like. You learn slowly. The Psalms is just full of statements that tell you what God is like, so it's very rich in our thinking about what it means uh, to be disciples of this God. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, as we go through the Psalms in this particular series in Term 2, we've picked, in a sense, what might seem like very random Psalms. Maybe if you can just explain uh, what specific things there are that are really helpful for us when we look at these sorts of Psalms. So, an imprecatory Psalm is a Psalm in which somebody is praying for God to judge the enemy. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just making sure we're talking about the right psalms. Yes, yes. So these are often very difficult psalms um, because they often say things that we would find it difficult to pray. And um, it may be in part because we live very comfortable lives um, and I can imagine somebody, a Christian living in Syria or Afghanistan, um, finding these prayers um, closer to them mm. out of their situation. Um, but I think the challenge, even for such a Christian as that, is to ask what it means to pray that psalm through Christ. Um, and so those, it's true of all the Psalms. Now, the Psalms are all about Jesus before they're about us. And even though what I said before is still true, I feel a very immediate connection to the Psalms. Sometimes you have to step back from that connection and ask the question about its relationship to Jesus so that when I come back to that direction connection, um, it's truer and richer. And mm. so I think for the Psalms of Imprecation, um, a good first question is, um, where do I see a prayer like this reflected in Jesus' own life? That'll be a starting question. Yes, yes, that's very helpful. Uh, I guess one of the reasons for this video is to help mm. our growth team leaders, uh, our growth teams are our Bible study leaders, mm -hmm. uh, to try and I guess get tips and tricks in terms of things that might be helpful when they are approaching the Psalms in order to, at the end, write a Bible study that will be for their group. Uh, I guess we'll get to implication, application things in a second, but just when we first approach a Psalm, say something like Psalm 8, which will be the first one in the series. Psalm 8? 8, yes. Okay. The first one in the series. Uh, <clears throat> what is the sort of way that would be helpful in terms of approaching it? Do we read it line by line? Do we want to take it as a big picture thing? We won't read it literally, understand poetry for what it is. Yeah. What, what, what are some helpful tricks and tips? I think that the first thing that I would do uh, is just think about the psalm by itself. I wouldn't worry about the other psalms or its 
location in the, in the book of Psalms. I wouldn't particularly worry about um, the person who's in the title. I'm just, I'd think about it as uh, a poem and study it in the way that maybe my English teachers hoped I would be able to study poetry in high school. <laughs> Um, and uh, look for uh, the way in which the bringing of ideas together, the balancing of ideas, because Hebrew poetry is all about um, the symmetry of ideas and the balance of ideas. Um, how does that um, work? Actually reflect, don't jump straight to uh, what the psalm means but sit with um, what it is um, with its images um, uh, with its poetic form and just try and feel uh, the dramatic or emotional journey that that series of ideas and images and pictures is taking you on mm -hmm. as you move through the psalm so if I was to start a psalm like Psalm 8, um, I would try to do that at the, at the beginning, mm -hmm. just to think about how it works as a piece of poetry um, and the journey it takes me on, even emotionally, dramatically. And then mm. um, I would do something that is a little bit more like traditional um, exposition or Bible study and say, well, what is this sentence? mean? What does it refer to? How does the argument uh, add up? What's the, the psalm as a whole uh, trying to say? Um, so those two sets of questions, if you like, the, the, the emotional journey and the, the argument of the psalm, those are the first two things I think I'd be yeah. looking at to get me started. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so I guess just you mentioned not to go to the other Psalms, but it is something that people have been asking about a little bit. Uh, why are there five books within the collection of the Psalms? Sure. What is that? And I did say that's not, I wouldn't begin. Begin, that's right. Yes, I guess. Going to the other yes, Psalms. Yes. Um, so the, the book of Psalms is a collection of collections. And uh, the five books are roughly five collections uh, or maybe four collections because books one and two are very closely connected to each other um, and they are collections that um, they're not it's not like they were written in that order because obviously there are psalms that are very old you know going the oldest psalm as you know is psalm 90 the psalm mm -hmm. of Moses it's, it's not at the beginning, you know, yeah. it's in the middle. Um, whereas maybe the most recent Psalms would be from very late in Israel's history. Uh, I think um, obviously there's the By the Waters of Babylon, mm. Um, mm. an imprecation. Mm. Uh, it's actually Psalm in our series. <laughs> 137, yeah. which reflects um, the Israelite uh, experience of exile. Um, there are other Psalms that I think. Uh, scholars uh, would look at the subtle v details of their vocabulary and things like that and say they might even come from the time of Ezra after the return from exile. Um, you know, Psalm 147 talks about the bars of Jerusalem, the bars of the gates or something like that. Then that's language that's out of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in the background of that psalm is Nehemiah's rebuilding the city. So the, um, the psalms span the history of Israel um, and the books also, I think, span the history of Israel, but not because of the authors, more because of themes. So I think sure. the author who put all of those psalms together mm. collected psalms at the beginning uh, that focused on King David and his life um, and then by the time you get to Psalm 72 at the end of Book 2, 
uh, you've moved on to King Solomon, mm. and then book three, uh, the focus of those, the back, they're thinking about the divided kingdom, um, leading up to the fall of Jerusalem uh, and the exile. Book four, I think they have the time of the exile in mind. The last psalm in book four, Psalm 106, prays that God would bring people back from exile. Mm. And then the first psalm of book five, Psalm 107, gives thanks for God bringing them back from exile. Mm. And mm. so the last book um, seems to have in the background uh, the experience of the return from exile. It doesn't mean that that's when the psalms were written. Right, the the exile book, book three, has got the Psalm of Moses in it, mm. but it's being collected to allow Israel to reflect through these poems on God's long plan to bring His Messiah to a position of ruling over the nations through the very troubled and rebellious history of Israel. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more I can say, but I think <laughs> I feel like I've been already talking long enough. <laughs> so I'll throw it back to you, Ben. Sure. <laughs> um, uh, it's fascinating, and I guess this is one of the beautiful things when we look at the Psalms. I remember in class you made us look at just our favorite pieces of poetry just to get into the vibe of looking at poetry for a while, and then we can just keep digging and exploring yeah. for forever and ever. Um, you, you started to mention that these things are now uh, they're, they are collected for a number of reasons, including to help us to see how the Messiah comes to fulfill yeah. all of these things. I guess if we then move to, uh, so we've we've had a look at a psalm, we've felt the psalm's emotional pull and where it's trying to mm -hmm. take us. We've started to look at some of the logic of the psalm. Mm -hmm. And he says it's really important to make sure that we also look at, this, uh, these psalms are about Jesus before they're about us. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the process in going about doing that? Yeah, okay. So let me go back to where I left off. You got me to think about the psalm, the book of psalms as mm -hmm. a whole. Um, Sorry, two, th two separate things. Mm -hmm. um, which one first? Okay, so uh, the, I talk, I've used the word journey. Mm -hmm. I think a psalm takes you on a little journey of discovery uh, or an, some sort of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's obvious in Psalm 8, um, the first and last verses are the same, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's clear that uh, the greatness of God is the theme of that psalm because it's topped and tailed. Um, but then you're going on a journey to discover the um, surprising nature of God's greatness, which is not the way that humans think about greatness. And so there's the little twist in Psalm 8. Um, the whole book of Psalms is one big journey. Um, and it's not a very straightforward journey like a narrative or a story. Because each psalm doesn't lead to the next psalm, it's like it's the next thing that happened. You know, it's not like that. Um, but Psalms, Psalm two, tells you the story of the whole book of Psalms, which is about uh, what what is it the um, uh, the nations rising up against the Lord and His Messiah, mm -hmm. and the Lord responding to their rebellion by saying, I've placed my son on Zion mm. and the rule of God's Messiah over those rebellious nations. Um, that is the end point of the book of Psalms. And so the story is, how do we get there? Mm. Um, and when by saying the Psalms is about Jesus first, because that was your question, I haven't forgotten. <laughs> yep. um, it's actually the journey that God's Messiah travels, which is David, the Davidic kings, but ultimately it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it's a journey that goes through um, hardship, through failure, uh, through suffering. Um, but all of that difficulty turns out to be the means that God is using mm -hmm. to raise his son to reign over all creation. Um, and so uh, a, f a number of scholars in the Psalms have pointed to a famous passage in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, um, where 
Jesus, who was in very nature God, did not consider uh, equality with God something to be exploited, but made himself in a human. And there's that downward, it was obedient even unto death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him. And that shape is the shape of the book of Psalms. And if that's where I should start thinking about the the meaning of a psalm uh, for Jesus. Um, how does this psalm uh, encapsulate Jesus' Philippians 2 journey? Okay. Um, and each psalm does it, but the whole book of Psalms does it as well. Um, so that's probably where I would begin. There's obviously... Uh, more to say, mm-hmm. but I think that's where I'd start. Yeah, nice. Um, I guess we've now looked at the Jesus part in terms of the preparation, and then now moving from that to then think about implication, application mm-hmm. for us, for the mm-hmm. people in the room in the Bible study. Mm-hmm. Uh, what would that process look like? So that we're, we want to be careful to not jump to conclusions that aren't actually in the Psalms or that don't really match up with what they're saying, but sometimes that can be something that we're tempted to do. What's the way to sort of help navigate that? The Psalms is a little bit like a play with a cast of characters. And the characters are all there in Psalm 2 um, and Psalm 1. But in Psalm 2, there are the the enemies, Hmm. the kings and the nations. There's the Lord. There's the Messiah. And then at the last verse of Psalm 2, it says, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that, the refugee, uh, is the other character. And I think that person who takes refuge, who's blessed, is actually the main character of Psalm 1, which begins, Blessed is the one who does not uh, you know, sit, stand, walk mm. uh, with the wicked, but who meditates on the law of the Lord. And um, in some ways, that person is two people. It's Jesus, because the person who takes refuge most often in the book of Psalms is actually God's Messiah, Mm. ironically. Mm. Um, David cries out in his weakness because he's surrounded by enemies, uh, by sickness, by oppression, and he says, I take refuge in you, I take refuge in you, again and again, especially in the first 40 psalms. Um, But then the psalmist will speak to the congregation and invite them to imitate him. And so uh, as a reader of the psalms, I'm being invited to walk the same journey that Jesus walked and to follow in his footsteps. And so um, at the point of view, uh, at the point of application, I think... I want to position myself as that refugee in Psalm 2, verse 12, um, who's following Jesus' journey, taking up my cross and saying, from this position, what what does this psalm show me that I must do? How does this psalm help me to live? That's very helpful. That's very helpful and insightful. And I'm hoping as we look at this and as we wrestle with the Psalms, that's something that we're able to draw out. I think it would be so helpful for our congregations and also just individual people and what they're currently going through and the comfort that can come from that. Um, I guess this last question is really just a say anything you'd like sort of question. But just, I guess it's... uh, if there, were, if there was one thing you wanted to tell all the growth team leaders at Auburn and Newington Anglican, as in turn through we dive into the Psalms, the staff will preach on them and then we'll look at them in growth teams as well. Uh, what's the sort of the statement that you'd like to make about the Psalms or the encouragement you have or the, the one thing you'd really like us to look at or the hope you have for us as a church? Or oh, no, Ben. It just feels like you're throwing your line into the water, <laughs> hopefully. Yes, that's right. Um, I think I would encourage people um, to get serious about praying the Psalms privately. Get serious about praying the Psalms privately. I think that would be helpful. 
Yeah, oh, that's very helpful indeed. Well, thank you very much for the chat. And oh. Thanks for taking the time, and I'm sure we'll appreciate it as we start creating these Bible studies and having a look at the Psalms. Okay. Uh, and I'll try and send you an email with some of the things that we learned. As we That'll be along. great. I always, there's always more to learn. <laughs> Me so too. Thanks, right. Ben. Thank you. Cheers.